Okay. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned in the snapshot uh, 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 series, um, what, what uh, we've done for many years is uh, study chemical systems with the aim of getting some insights into biological systems. And the idea is that uh, certain chemical systems like the blusov chabotinsky reaction show dynamics, exhibit dynamics, that uh, is remarkably similar to dynamics you see in living systems. The difference is that the uh, chemical system, this BZ reaction, or BZ, is um, it's very well defined. The state variables are simple concentrations. The governing equations are well-established kinetics and transport laws, and, and, and that's the difference. So we can really delve in deeply, whereas in biological systems, oftentimes you don't even know the state variables, let alone the uh, govern equ governing equations are sometimes uh, even more difficult. So that's, that's the theme. Um, I like to start off uh, thanking people so that they're, they're because that's the most they're, they're the most uh, important. Uh, Mark Tinsley has been uh, with me at WVU for uh, many years and and uh, he does uh, most of the work. Uh, Annette Taylor is now at Sheffield and she's uh, involved in a lot of this. Uh, Zhao Young Huang uh, is a former grad student, so is uh, Fang Wang, and so is Simba Nkomo. And Jan Totes and Harold Engel are colleagues at uh, TU Berlin. And of course, thank the funders, uh, without whom none of this would be possible. OK, so uh, to get started, um, first I'd like to tell you a little a bit, some basics. And uh, we'll start off by talking about reaction diffusion fronts. Um, in all self-organizing processes, you need to have some sort of feedback, either positive feedback or negative feedback. In this case, I'm describing positive feedback, and this is as simple as it gets. A is a uh, reactant, reacts with B, 2B, to give 3B. So as it, here's the rate law, the rate law for B depends upon B squared. So the more B is generated, the faster it's generated. And so that's uh, an, a, a, like an explosion, except it's an isothermal explosion. And here's your reaction diffusion equation. You know, here's just fixed second law. And here are the, uh, you can make this one variable because A and B have to add up to the same. And so when we look at this, the first thing that happens when we spike this with a little bit of B, is B starts to spread out by diffusion and starts to grow. It start, it's consuming A, and now uh, it very rapidly uh, goes up to its maximum, and now it's converting this A to B as it propagates with constant velocity and constant waveform. So that's how a reaction diffusion wave, the simplest of all, works. You can make this reaction more complex by just adding one, by adding the decay of the activator or autocatalyst and making it an open system. So we always supply A and B. They, you can do this and, you know, the engineers do this all the time with continuously stirred tank reactors. But open systems are very important because we are all open systems. You know, we take in energy and we uh, expel waste. And so in this case, what's going to happen, we, we spike this with A here, uh, I'm sorry, B here, and, but now this system oscillates in time. And what you're going to see is that the rise is similar, but we have a decay in the back. And what this allows, this is called a propagating pulse, this allows the, um, uh, successive waves, and uh, and so that's very important in all, especially living systems. You know, nerve impulses. Uh, okay, so here's a famous picture by a famous person, Art Winfrey, um, 
Here is, the, these are thin films of Belusov chabotinsky solution that I'll tell you more about as we go on. And the, the uh, reaction is uh, uh, set off by imperfections, you know, little uh, inhomogeneities in the solution or, or scratches on the glass or whatever. You can see that they uh, put out waves at different frequencies. If you take one of these waves and you break it, what happens is you get these counter-rotating spirals. And now you see that once things settle down, it's more or less a constant wavelength, no matter, and so these don't depend upon any heterogeneity. Of course, spirals are very fundamental uh, uh, and uh, everywhere, and so it's important to learn about them. How does a spiral form? Well, if you have an experiment, we do this in the in this hands-on uh, sessions. We just kind of tilt it very carefully, and you break a wave. In a simulation, you can break a wave just by removing the top half of the simulation. And so what happens is that the red is the autocatalyst, and here it diffuses ahead and initiates autocatalysis, so it's self-propagating. And so in the planar region, it's got its all constant velocity. But at the tip, it can not only diffuse ahead, it can diffuse out to the side. So there's less autocatalyst, less activator. And so it isn't as fast. And so it falls back, and it falls back, it falls back. And at the tip, there's a zero velocity. And that's how spirals work. The blue is the recovery variable. So you can see the activator here, the inhibitor here. Uh, this is a cut through right here. And so on this side, you can see that the autocatalyst shoots up. In the BZ reaction, it, uh, it increases by five orders of magnitude in concentration in a millisecond. And then it shoots back down, and the recovery variable uh, uh, resets the clock, basically. Um, so that's the way spirals work. Um, most spirals and uh, patterns are studied in planar configurations. And so one can also look in a non-planar uh, uh, configuration. Here is a bead similar to the ones that you just saw uh, in the uh, hands-on experiment, about 1.4 millimeters in diameter, about three times as large. And um, this has a spiral wave on it starting at the North Pole and you can see through this bead. And so it comes around and crosses the equator, goes behind, crosses the equator again, and goes down to the South Pole. And you can see in, this, in these snapshots that uh, these are uh, taken at every, uh, what, 12.8 seconds. And bam, 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 bam. This is one period right here. And bam, 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 this is another period. So it's kind of like a spherical barber pole or something like that. So why would anybody be interested in uh, sphere, uh, uh, spiral waves on spheres? <laughs> you have to ask that, right? Uh, well, there's a lot of reason to be interested. And one of the uh, most important reasons is our heart. Uh, you, uh, the heart. Uh, operates by uh, the sinus node, which is a collection of cells that's per that fire periodically. And there's an electromechanical wave that spreads through the atria and then goes down these Purkinje fibers to the ventricles. And this complex root uh, gives rise to productive pumping of blood. And so normal pumping is like this. It's uh, uh, every uh, a little bit uh, less than a second or so. Here's a simulation. But occasionally, uh, people get this pump, 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 pump in their heart. This is called tachycardia. And it looks like this in the electrocardiogram. And the reason it is occurring is because a wave broke, just like the wave we were discussing, and it started uh, forming a spiral. And the spiral has a period that is sh shorter than the, sinus, uh, than the uh, pacemaker. Um, uh, uh, and so 
it's, it's, if, if it's atrial, it's, it's not lethal. Uh, even vent, uh, if it's ventricular, it's not lethal. But the spirals can break up again, and then you're in trouble. Um, because your heart is working hard, but it's not doing anything useful. You know, it's uh, uh, cardiac fibrillation. And so, uh, and this is a, a, real, uh, uh, a real experiment here. I highly recommend this website. This is um, uh, from Flavio uh, Fenton and Elizabeth Cherry, uh, and they have done a fabulous job of uh, putting up a website on heart dynamics. Okay, so let's uh, move on. One can uh, do other things. Oh, no, I wanted to make another point. So what, does this, what insights do, do, uh, does this experiment give us? Well, this is a normal spiral wave at the North Pole, but the geometry forces an uh, abnormal spiral wave at the South Pole. It is a sink, and, and so the heart is not a sphere, but it's not planar either, and so spirals must also have a, 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 a sink of some sort. It turns out this is quite complicated. It involves a spiral that collapses periodically. And uh, there's been a lot of theoretical work on this now. Um, OK, so you could also ask, uh, what is it um, uh, like? Uh, you know, we know that uh, biological systems are cellular. So let's look at uh, excitable m media that's cellular. And um, I learned at some, oh, it was dynamic stays in Budapest uh, many, many years ago. Uh, I learned uh, that uh, sulfon membranes, uh, ferroin sticks very well to them. So I came uh, back to WVU and I told Oliver Steinbach, who was with me at the time, uh, that we should use a, uh, you know, a, a plotter to uh, draw things with this, uh, with ferroin. He had a much better idea. He says, let's use an inkjet printer. And so we printed an array of triangles and, um, and put it on a, uh, a gel of, uh, of reactant with catalyst-free reactant and waited to see what happens. You can see that this array of triangles, the triangles are red, uh, are ferroin, uh, and the wave is blue. Uh, gives rise to these hexagonal structures. So the local geometry gives rise to global anisotropy. Uh, probably more important, and, and that's true in the heart too, because heart cells are elongated and your uh, waves are, are uh, distorted. But more importantly, the spirals form spontaneously. And uh, I forgot to say, but you can kind of infer it from my description of the spiral, they're not spontaneous in a homogeneous system. Uh, you have to set up special initial conditions to get a spiral. You don't hear in heterogeneous media. OK, so now I'd like to tell you about how you can use another version of the BZ reaction that's light sensitive to also do some interesting experiments that have some um, some uh, offer insights into uh, biological systems. This special catalyst is a ruthenium compound, and what it does when it uh, is exposed to light, it generates bromide in this solution. Bromide is the inhibitor of autocatalysis, so it's, it serves as the inhibitor, and uh, there's another chemical called bromous acid that's the activator. So we thought it'd be fun to um, to look and uh, see what uh, noise does to uh, 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 propagating waves. And uh, this is actually smooth. My loop in the video uh, puts a stop to it. But we're basically taking a, um, a random, you know, on the interval uh, uh, intensities, putting them in uh, different size blocks, and, um, and then having a wave propagate through this. Over here is dark, and a, a wave, a, we make a spiral wave here, and then it propagates in here. And this is the mean zero average of the noise, OK? We've set this up to be sub-excitable, and I'm going to talk more about what that means. But it means that it doesn't support sustained wave propagation. And so 
the wave comes in here and it experiences this uh, noise. Okay, so here is an example of uh, what we see. The noise level is basically our, from zero to the maximum that we can achieve. And, uh, and so with zero noise, this is what a sub-excitable medium does. I just got through telling you that free ends of, of waves, chemical or heart, or any other, curl up to form spirals. But if you make the medium less and less excitable, less and less active, you get to the point that they don't curl up anymore and they just contract. This is like if you had a piece of paper, you lit the corner and the flame burns through the paper, but then you do the experiment again and you use a squirter to make it moist. And you reach a point pretty soon that the wave doesn't propagate through, but it fails. You get wave failure, propagation failure. Okay, and so you can see as we add noise, it goes a little bit further, add more noise, it is sustained, add more noise, our max, and it's not so good because it's so much that it starts to cause trouble. And so we can just see this, actually I think the overlays are, actually, are more informative than the movies, but uh, here's what the movies look like. Um, and so we figured that the most important thing was uh, to measure the signal at this point where there's no noise and, and use that as a measure of, of what the noise is doing. Yes? The, we, that's a spiral wave sending in successive waves. Over here there's a spiral that's sending in successive waves. Is this the spiral wave at what position are we looking? Are we looking like this? Uh, uh, no, the spiral is over here in that black box that I showed you earlier. And it is moving like this? Yes, uh-huh. Okay. And, and this, is, this is a channel that it can, only, it can only take a slice of it because it can't propagate outside of this channel. Uh, it can be, uh, it, it's generally, it should be perpendicular, but things aren't always perfect. Okay, and so, so what happens is, if you look at this, uh, if you have a cell size that's four pixels by four pixels, you increase the noise, you increase the noise, and you reach a maximum of about 60%, and then it starts to fall off because the noise is so much that it's breaking the waves, and some propagate well, some are, are, going, uh, are do not. And you can also say this is reflected in the error bars here. So this is a lot like stochastic resonance, but you know it's not exactly like stochastic resonance, so we call it stochastic resonance-like. And uh, if you make the box size smaller, you have to go to a higher noise level to reach the maximum, and then it's cut off. So how is this relevant to biological systems? Well, um, uh, Frank Moss and uh, Peter Jung uh, teamed up with uh, Anne Cornell Bell and her student and um, looked at cultured glial cells. Now, you can infuse canate into glial cells, and if you put you know, 10 millimolar, you don't see anything. If you put 100 millimolar, you just see noise. But somewhere in between 50 millimolar, you see these objects appear that are circular waves propagate out and fail. And so you do see that this, uh, no, uh, and canate makes the glial cells, it's a very noisy because it's all ion channel transport. And, uh, and so that they felt that this was important. Uh, they felt that, this, that the, the, our experiments reinforced their interpretation. You know, it's all, uh, the, it just depends on your interpretation. Um, another example of uh, waves in uh, biological systems, I wanted to just show you this because it's so beautiful. Eric Newman and Kathleen Soss um, uh, did these experiments. You can initiate waves mechanically, chemically, or um, electrically. This is mechanical. This is just a pipette. And this is the um, uh, uh, calcium waves in, in uh, uh, retinal glial cells. And, um, and so you can see it propagates out beautifully. 
here in the bottom panels, uh, this shows a time lapse of propagating out. Then uh, they tried to initiate it at 180 seconds later, and it was refractory. It wouldn't initiate because it's in the wave tail. And then at 270 seconds later, it, it propagated out beautifully again. Now, uh, their, they, uh, their uh, cover picture, um, you can see this is the five panels that we just kind of looked at, uh, made uh, to be look uh, nicer. But, it, but you can see that it's a sub-excitable medium, first off. It fails. And then uh, there's a propagation failure. And you can also see that uh, you know, they didn't say anything about noise. And I don't want to say too much other than it looks kind of noisy to me. Um, OK, so one of the things we wanted to do was uh, try to figure out exactly what sub-excitable means. And you know, we saw this picture before, and uh, um, you kind of uh, see that sub-excitable means that there is no sustained propagation. There is propagation, but not sustained, if you have a wave with free ends. Okay? And so we thought, well, let's try to understand this a little better. And, um, and so we have a similar setup to the noise experiment, but now we're just going to, we have this channel that uh, we can have a spiral wave, we can have a big spiral wave over here, and this is the channel it comes into. And then this is a region that we can adjust the excitability by adjusting the light. And I realize now that I didn't tell you a critical thing, and that is, well, I did. I, I said that uh, this uh, catalyst, the photosensitive catalyst, it reacts with bromomalonic acid to give bromide, which is an inhibitor. So the higher the light intensity, the lower the activity or the excitability. The lower the light intensity, the higher the activity. And so we make this very high so that the wave cannot propagate in here, but we can adjust this. Okay, so that's our experiment. What do we find? Well, what we find is that for a particular background light intensity, if we use a simple linear, it's actually negative feedback because of this inverse, higher the intensity, lower the excitability, uh, it's a very simple linear feedback. And so what happens is if this wave starts to grow, we, try, we, we see that it's, it's uh, growing, and so A increases, uh, that means that uh, the light intensity increases, so it shrinks back. If it shrinks too much, uh, you can see that A decreases, so the light intensity decreases, and the wave grows back. And so the wave size is fundamentally important in, in this, um, in this uh, system. And, and so, uh, you know, A is just, you just count the pixels as it goes through a window to get the area. Uh, uh, small a is the gain, and b is the offset, and the offset in our case is the background light, the excitability, uh, to, uh, to determine the excitability. And so what does this give us? It gives us a locus of stabilized waves that looks, that, uh, looks like this. Uh, this is increasing light intensity, so it's decreasing uh, excitability. Okay, now if, if you are on this locus somewhere, if, you, if you're exactly on it, you stay on it. If you have a feedback algorithm, you also stay on it. But if you move over to here, it's a sub-excitable medium, and it is not sustained, and it collapses. On this side, if we should move over here, it forms a spiral wave, and it happily uh, uh, rotates. What happens as you get closer and closer to this locus, uh, this wave wavelength gets longer and longer, and it basically becomes a planar wave. And and in the asymptote, it's unbounded and is uh, an infinite planar wave. This dotted line is the 1D co uh, collapse of the wave, and that's the absolute 
uh, threshold for wave propagation. And so the subexcitable medium is this region right here. And, uh, and, and that's actually a pretty uh, fundamental thing we learned. Now that we have these waves, we can make them do what we want them to do. This is not a pickle. This is a, uh, a wave segment. And it's in an excitability gradient. And the gradient is perpendicular to the normal norm of the, um, of the uh, vo uh, wave velocity. And, and so what we do, the, as I said, uh, light, uh, it's, it's photophobic. And so it's a, you know, it's, uh, it's, it goes to the dark. It goes to the dark side. And, uh, and here is our uh, experiment again. It's kind of a very similar experiment. And, uh, and so you can, you can do all kinds of things with this. One thing you can do is you can design a trajectory that you want the wave to follow. These hypotrochoid trajectories, here's a circle, here's a three lobe, here's a four lobe hypotrochoid. And so, you know, these are simulations they are not as interesting as the experiments because in the experiments you can see that it starts to get off track. You know, someone opened the lab door and let some light in or something like that. And, and the algorithm adjusts the gradient proportional to the current position and the desired position, the target position. And so the further you are away from where you are supposed to be, the harder you're driven back. And so it follows it. And, uh, and that's uh, just one of the things you can do. Well, uh, of course, we were really happy to get this in science and, and so forth. Um, but then you go through, you're doing the galley proofs and, and you know, do you want to send on a cover picture? And uh, Eugene Mihailuk, who was uh, my former uh, PhD student and stayed on for a uh, postdoc, he brought me pictures that uh, he did kind of the natural colorings. And ruthenium isn't nearly as pretty as the ferroin. It's kind of orange and green, and it really looks bad um, in, in a figure. And so then he made you know red and blue. Uh, like ruthenium, or like uh, ferroin would be, but it was not very truthful. But you know, who cares about that? Uh, and you know, uh, finally he came and he says, "I've made for you the most obnoxious color combination that I can think of." And so he gives it to me, and I said, "I like it." <laughs> and so. Uh, you know, it's all, it's all marketing, and uh, it means uh, very little other than marketing. Uh, but uh, we were very happy um, when it got on the cover. I asked this uh, cover, whatever they're called, cover manager, why did they selected it? And they said they've never seen anything like it. Uh, it may be because it was so garish, you know. So, uh, um, so you can... Um, Look at one of these. Uh, here is a four-lobed um, hypotrochoid. This is simulation. It wouldn't be so perfect an experiment. And then you can um, uh, you can put a uh, 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 you can make it uh, take a random walk. You know, you just uh, uh, select the gradient from a, a uniform probability distribution at and every uh, on equal time intervals, and the purplish one is has the waves so you can see how they go but there's also a uh, completely different yellow and blue trajectory depending upon your uh, where you, uh, your initial conditions and I think it would also uh, depend e also as well on the noise seed and so on this you can uh, see that um, the wave uh, does kind of a, a brownian brownian walk Okay, here's the experiment. Here's our little channel that the waves come into. And, you know, it's not as magnificent as the simulations, but it's experiment. And so that's uh, really nice. Okay, so um, more recently, we wanted to take a look at um, kind of moving away from waves. Um, what, uh, look, look, look instead at uh, discrete oscillators. and. This 
whole avenue for us was inspired by this gorgeous paper by Sylvia de Monte and Paris and her student and Preben Sorensen in Copenhagen and his student. And uh, it all started a long time ago, this is a long, long time ago, 1976, by the biologist Aldridge and Pye. And they found that if you have a stirred suspension of yeast cells, they will, if, it's, uh, if the number density is high enough, they will oscillate in synchrony. So this yeast cell system became a paradigmatic system because it is like fundamental sig cell signaling. It, they have to be talking to each other to oscillate in synchrony. But their experiment in the paper was they, uh, they decreased the number density by dilution of the medium. And at a point, it suddenly stopped in unison, stopped oscillating. There are two possibilities. One possibility is at that point, it's oscillating fine over here. Zero is the point that uh, they got the, the, this critical number density. They just come dephased, become dephased, and the global signal is flat. That's one possibility. That's what everybody believed, actually. The other possibility is that at this critical number density, all the individual oscillators change states and relax to their steady states. And this, is, this was intriguing because it's very much like quorum sensing. You know, quorum sensing in bacteria, uh, you have uh, behavior, one behavior, and then you reach a critical density, say in vibro fissuri, and you suddenly, uh, they start uh, chemiluminescing. Um, uh, likewise, in uh, 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 Pseudomonas arginosa, uh, you uh, form biofilm at a critical density, and this is kind of a, a very a bad uh, thing if it happens in your lungs. And so, what, uh, what the uh, 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 Sorensen uh, study, the Copenhagen and Paris study, I should say, uh, they uh, tested this. Uh, they had a, a reactor. They're pumping in these yeasts, so they're all uh, the same age and so forth. And, uh, and they, they studied this, and they uh, had good evidence that it was the quorum sensing transition. And so we thought, well, we should probably uh, look at this with, the, uh, with uh, BZ um, uh, discrete oscillators. And um, uh, uh, Annette Taylor and Mark Tinsley had done a, a beautiful study earlier, earlier than uh, this 2007 paper, uh, one year, and um, they, uh, they found synchronization in uh, a, a, a solution, a, a suspension of these uh, beads. And so you can see that basically uh, Z is your catalyst, uh, X is your uh, activator, and uh, Y is your inhibitor. The catalyst is immobilized, just like in the hands-on uh, session. The, neat, the really nice thing about this uh, system is that in a two by two cuvette, you can have about 100,000 uh, oscillators. And so you really get a lot of oscillators. This, what I described to you, is global coupling. The, the X and the Y go into the solution and are felt by all the other oscillators, okay? So here's our experiment. It's a very simple experiment. Oh, I need to hurry up. Um, you know, we look at it with a camera and uh, with a fast shutter speed, we can freeze frame things. Uh, here's an oscillation in black and white, unfortunately. And uh, here are the oscillations in the images and here's the electrochemistry also telling us about the oscillations. Okay, so we can talk about exchange rate, and for us it's just stirring rate, but you do simulations and you really worry about the details of the exchange rate. And as you step up the density, number density, in this little staircase, you see that you have kind of this noisy signal and small noisy, and now it looks like real oscillations, low amplitude, and then finally it gets to large amplitude. If you look at the, uh, the millivolts, the electrochemistry, 
it's not zero, but and you have kind of a gradual rise. The, the uh, images say that about 20% here, uh, we're measuring here the fraction of the beads that are excited. And so about 20% 20, 20 um, are, um, are, are uh, not excited. Do I have this backwards? Um, uh, yeah, 20% 20, 20 are different. I think that they're uh, not excited and the period is not very informative. So this is really uh, the signature of a, um, a classic uh, Kuramoto transition. It's oscillating. They're all oscillating out of phase here, out of phase, but then they phase, they phase synchronize and you have this uh, Kuramoto-like rise. So if you change the uh, stirring rate to now, um, oh, I'm sorry, I have to uh, go this way. Oh, no, I'm okay. Okay, so now, uh, I, 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 okay, yes. Uh, Okay, I'm sorry, I, uh, I got uh, mixed up where I was. Okay, now we're gonna look at higher uh, stirring rate, higher exchange rate. And you can see now there, there are just no, uh, everything is not uh, oscillating over here. Over here, this is really uh, it's thick as pea soup almost. Uh, they, it's oscillating in synchrony. And so if you look at, uh, uh, look at this, um, these are now simulations. Uh, you can analyze this by looking at the exchange rate and the number density. And these two experiments took place in two different uh, regimes. At low exchange rate, low stirring, you, uh, if, and if you cr increase the number density, you would have this gradual synchronization of, uh, uh, but it would still be oscillating when it was unsynchronized, like a Kuramoto transition. But at high exchange rate, it's not oscillating at all. It's flat, and then you have this uh, jump to uh, oscillations. This is kind of like a first, first order, second order uh, phase transition. But what it tells us about the, you know, I think what we learned that was really important here is that even though Sorensen and uh, De Monte found uh, th this avenue in the yeast experiments, there's no reason that they shouldn't find this avenue as well for synchronization if, if the parameters are accessible. And this is true for all of, of these uh, uh, quorum sensing type um, uh, transitions. One should also see the gradual Kuramoto type transition as well. Um, if the parameters are accessible. Uh, so so I, I think that that, that really did um, uh, add some insights into the um, uh, uh, this quorum sensing Kuramoto transition um, phenomenon. Okay, I want to finish up by talking about uh, chimera states. And, um, you know, Chimera states were first discovered by Kuramoto and Batak and uh, 2002. And Strogatz in 2004 named it uh, and also did a lot of bifurcation analysis on it. And uh, a, a Chimera is, a, you know, in the Greek mythology, it's pictured as incongruous animals glued together you know, a lion with a goat coming out the back and a serpent tail and so forth. These should not exist together. And so in, in uh, oscillator systems, and most of these studies have been done with Kuramoto phase oscillators, you can have a system, say with 100 oscillators, some of the oscillators are synchronized, perfectly synchronized, and some of the and the rest of the oscillators are completely unsynchronized, and they coexist, even though the oscillators are identical, and they're coupled to each other identically. That's 
kind of an amazing phenomenon. Uh, and so it's a new kind of, it's a new state in synchronization that uh, people became interested in. Uh, Shima and Kor Koromoto in the same year, 2004, as uh, Strogatz uh, coined uh, Chimera, um, uh, they uh, discovered uh, spiral chimeras, which are really wonderfully exotic. So I'm just going to, you know, we don't need to spend time on this because I don't want to run out of time. Um, it's kind of the same setup, except now instead of a uh, reaction diffusion system, we focus the light on each individual oscillator and, uh, oh, this is actually important. In all these experiments, we have a different BZ recipe so that light is not inhibitory, light is excitatory. So we shine light and this catalyst causes um, uh, bromous acid to be generated and you get phase advances. In fact, these are phase resetting oscillators. And uh, that's, that's the only difference. And uh, so our coupling here, this is important. Our coupling, this is the light you would shine on oscillator J. This is the background light. This is the transmitted light intensity of oscillator J. This is the transmitted light intensity of all the other oscillators from J minus N to J plus N. And you just take the difference, multiply it by a constant. That constant looks like this. Uh, you know, here's the constant. It's Kuramoto invented this uh, coupling and it's basically exponentially, uh, exponential fall off. And so if this is oscillator J uh, in this row of cherries, the coupling strength is indicated by the, the, by the thickness of their stems. So the coupling falls off as you go uh, away from J. And every oscillator has exactly the same coupling. Now, if you have this kappa is the relaxation or the decay constant of the coupling. And with high kappa, you have very short range coupling. With low kappa, you have very long range coupling. And we found somewhere in the middle, like 0.4, gives us a nice, uh, nice result. This is a local order parameter. It basically, it, uh, it looks at the phases theta around oscillator J within a coupling radius of uh, m to the left and m to the right. Okay, so here is uh, 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 experiments that are one dimensional. It's a one dimensional chimera where you have 40 oscillators, I believe, uh, that uh, are in a circle. So you have periodic boundary conditions. And you can see this goes five times faster, so you can see this aperiodicity. This is synchronized. In chemistry, it, the synchronized always is faster because uh, the firing together uh, makes things uh, reset faster. It's just the opposite in phase oscillators. But, uh, but this is the, uh, the aperiodic region, and that's essential uh, for uh, a chimera. Um, so I don't want to spend uh, too much time on the one-dimensional work, but I do want to tell you what, how this relates to biology. And uh, the main way is, uh, at least it's thought, I should say, uh, that it's relevant to unihemispheric uni sleep, which is found in a lot of animals, dolphins, seals, whales, sea lions, and a lot of, a lot of birds, and I've, I've seen recently in lizards as well. And so, especially animals of prey, you know, here's this seal, and he's got one eye open, looking for prey, you know. Uh, and the way he does this, he's got to sleep sometime, and he, so he has one hemisphere asleep, and the other is awake. And there's uh, very good evidence that you know this is true. Uh, in the one hemisphere, you have slow, uh, slow wave sleep, and the other uh, hemisphere, you have high frequency EEG. Uh, uh, dolphins or whales, they have to do the same thing because they have to know when to come up for air. Uh, Birds, some of these birds fly thousands of miles and they have to get some rest sometime. And so, uh, uh, and so that, that's, that's, the, that's thought to be the relevance. So, you know, you can also look at these uh, spiral wave chimeras. They can get very odd. Uh, you know, you have uh, looping behavior and so forth. 
um, and, and it's different on the two different cores. You can see the cores are different here. And, uh, and so they're not like regular spirals. Why are they called chimeras? Because this, the core is made up of asynchronous oscillators and the rest of the domain is made up of synchronized traveling waves. And, um, and so it's a really interesting type of uh, chimera state. Well, we also found when we did this work that even weirder things can happen. Namely, one core can kind of just go crazy, start splitting up and multiplying and so forth. And, uh, you know, it's just unlike any spiral type stuff uh, you've ever seen. And so um, a couple of years ago, I uh, was on sabbatical in Berlin and uh, working with Jan Totes and Harold Engel. And we decided, let's try to get this an experiment. And they have a wonderful machine lab at uh, TU Berlin. And so Jan had the shop um, precision micro machine, these arrays. This is a big array, uh, 2,816. And you, you have to get these BZ oscillators, so the hole has to be the right size. And, and we first had, tried water solutions. You couldn't get them in because of the surface tension, so we wound up using methanol. We could get them in with methanol. And so you look at this. This is just nothing but a glare from light. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but the, um, oh, yeah, this just started. I don't know what it is. OK, I'll just show you this. This is not very interesting. They're, they're, they're uh, un unsynchronized at first, and then they're, 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 they form a spiral chimera. Well, this is actually the uncoupled. This is just asynchronous. But oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken. This is actually the chimera. But, but to deal with this, we need to form a virtual array. And basically what that means is indexing. We find the oscillators that are uh, well behaved. Some are doub doubly occupied, some are dead. So we throw those away. And we look at all the good ones and we put them, you know, number them, put them in an array. And so we form a 40 by 40 array with 1600 oscillators in a virtual array. And we initiate it by periodically forcing it in kind of a conical arrangement. And um, so that you have. Um, uh, phase singularity in the middle, and then the, uh, the chimera uh, spiral uh, starts. And you can kind of see in the middle, this is just raw data. Here's that glare over there. Uh, and uh, you can kind of see that they're aperiodic. Okay, so let me uh, finish up quickly. Uh, so here's the same uh, information in a, in a kind of a, this is, this is the raw data again. You saw the early forcing. Uh, this is just period. You can see that it's kind of aperiodic and kind of more or less period, periodic in the spiral. And here are the phases, and this is the order parameter. So this is a well-behaved chimera spiral. But, oh, and I for, I've actually forgot a very important detail. Uh, in the early work, Kuramoto and Strogatz and many, many other theoretical papers, uh, a phase frustra frustration term was added to make all this happen so that the synchronization, synchronization isn't so strong. But actually, it was Abhijit Sen and uh, Gautam uh, Sethia who, was, who were instructors in this school, in its first school in 2008 in India. Uh, they started using a time delay instead. And it made a lot of sense because it takes time to deliver the signal. And as you change the time delay, things change rapidly. That, that, is, that is the key, key um, uh, uh, variable. Oops. And so if I can only get this movie to play, here we go. Um, OK, so now we've changed, we've increased this, this delay, and now odd things happen. It starts to split the core. And, um, and so uh, we found what we had uh, in experimentally, we found what we saw earlier. And you can see this in this plot. Here is the 
uh, period of the spiral wave which increases with delay and it, and it increases because it, they're phase resetting oscillators. The, this is the average period of the core and then this is the size, the fraction of the aperiodicity in the, in the medium. And finally, here are some movies um, Mark Tinsley made of, um, of uh, this is a splitting one. This, this uh, video is long, so I'm going to jump ahead. Let's jump to there. You can see that it's splitting uh, off little spirals, and it keeps splitting, keeps splitting, and, uh, and now it's pretty, it, it forms about nine. Uh, uh, but that, of course, is dependent on everything, initial conditions, et cetera. Now, you look at these difference in time scales. This is 8,700. 8, this is 2,000. Uh, 2, There's another domain when you increase this delay a little bit more that really looks, um, it's just, it, what happens is it just goes too fast to split. And uh, it just takes over the domain. And so, uh, so this, this is also another uh, very interesting thing. Uh, but another thing, actually, that requires further work. There's a lot of order in this disorder. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's a whole nother uh, thing to do. So, What's the color of gold in the middle? In the middle, that's the order parameter. Uh -huh. And blue is no or, uh, low order, and yellow is high order. OK, that's the local order parameter. And I think with that, I'm, oh well, just to check that this isn't a special thing with the BZ reaction, it also happens in the, B, in the Fitzhugh Nogumo, and, um, and with that, I, uh, thanks. All right, we have a few minutes for uh, questions. Uh, let me see if I get this microphone.